Okay, um, it's one o'clock, so I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting of May 17th, 2023. Um, we have a pretty full agenda today. Uh, we'll be looking at the vital fiscal year 24 budget, uh, which will be presented, I presume, by uh, Ms. Beth Anderson and Maureen Gilbert. We will also be uh, looking at a request from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems relating to uh, reconsideration of the fiscal year 24 hospital budget guidance. And then we'll have a staff presentation and potentially a vote relating to One Care Vermont's revised fiscal year 23 budget. Um, uh, first, I'll turn it to uh, our executive director, Susan Barrett, for her report. Thank you, Chair Foster. I wanted to announce uh, that we are going on the road. The Green Mountain Care Board is going out to Morrisville, Vermont, and of course, Vermont <laughs> on June 7th. And um, we're going to conduct our uh, board meeting in person uh, at the Green Mountain Support Services in Morrisville. Um, in the morning, the board members will uh, separate out and meet with different clinicians and organizations and businesses and learn about the learn more about the healthcare landscape in Morrisville. Um, information is on our website and we'll continue to update that under what's new. And if folks uh, are in the area or want to take a little road trip with us, we'd love to see you in Morrisville. Um, I do uh, need to read a rate review decision uh, that the board made, so I'm going to transition to that next and let everyone know that on May 11th, uh, 2023, the board issued its decision and order approving modifications to the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont Large Group rate filing. The decision and order are posted on the Green Mountain Care Board website on the What's New page and on the filing page on our rate review website. Um, for context, uh, per our statute, we must announce those decisions when they're made for context for all of you. Um, and in terms of public comments, we are opening a public comment period today uh, for the vital budget, and that will be open until May 29th. We have an ongoing uh, open public comment for the One Care Vermont's FY23 revised budget. And that uh, is open until May 24th. And certainly last but not least is the uh, potential next all pair model agreement public comment portal uh, where we're requesting any comments that the public has regarding a next potential model with the federal government. We share any of those comments with the Agency of Human Services in the governor's office as they are leading those negotiations and the implementation of that model. Any information regarding these public comments, um, the uh, items that I've just listed, materials are located on our website. So I'd encourage you to check those out. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take up the meeting minutes from May 5th, 2023. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from May 5th? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any board discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 And the minutes are unanimously approved. Um, and I'll turn to our first agenda item, the uh, vital budget, and I'll turn it over to, I, I believe, uh, Miss you, uh, you, Miss Anderson. Um, how are you? you? Please go ahead and introduce yourselves, and, and thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Um, I will, if you don't mind, um, take a minute to introduce the team, both so you know who's talking, but also we do have a new team member that I want you to know about. Um, so I'm Beth Anderson. I am the CEO at Vital, um, and I'll just quickly go around. We have Maureen Gilbert, who is our Director of Client Engagement. We have Christina Choquette, who's our Director of Operations. We have Sue Fritz, who's our Director of Technology. Our new team member, our new CFO, is Kara Callanan. So she is trial by fire. She's been with us for about a month now and joined in completing a budget and this presentation. So we want to welcome her. We're excited to have her on. And here for his, for real this time, last budget presentation uh, is Bob Turnow, who is helped pull this budget together, but will be formally retiring uh, in the coming weeks. So want to... I think you'll hear from much of the team during the presentation today. 
Um, so with that today, we'll I'll give a quick overview of kind of a summary of our fiscal year 23, which ends June 30th, uh, and with that kind of activities and budget, we'll talk through in a bit of detail about what our proposed budget for 24 is, what the state contract in support of that looks like. Um, and the team will do a little bit of program highlights and some of our key initiatives, and we'll present the quarterly metrics that we traditionally present. Then after that, I do have um, a quick couple of slides on a proposed amendment to this, the, the Vermont uh, HIE strategic plan that you approved in December, a slight change to that plan as well, which we'll go through. Um, so I'm sorry, you'll hear a lot uh, from me today. Um, well, Maureen, if you don't mind throwing up the slides, thank you. So to start off maybe on slide three, um, just a reminder for everyone about how our work is kind of grounded and oriented, and it's really in the um, four goals that are set out. Um, Maureen, if you don't mind going to slide three, please. The four goals laid out in the, the state's HIE strategic plan, which is defined by the HIE steering committee in partnership with the Agency for Human Services. Um, and also in vital strategic directions, or those are internal um, internal um, strategic goals that we have set in alignment with the plan and the work that we do. Um, the work we'll discuss today, both that is completing for 23, but also that is contemplated for our FY24 that starts on July 1st, really are grounded in the both the goals of that strategic plan, but also the deliverables and, and uh, work that was um, contemplated in the plan that was reviewed earlier this year. Um, so just moving forward to 23, just to give a sense of what some of the accomplishments we either are will have have completed or will complete by the end of the fiscal year on June 30. Morning slide five, please. Um, I'm not going to read the entire list to you, but I'll just go over some of the highlights. Um, we have um, one that we're really excited about is we have piloted through a partnership with VDH, making immunization data available to providers at the point of care through their EHRs by allowing them to query the immunization registry directly. Um, um, you'll hear more about that project later, but that's been a pretty exciting for us, but really for the healthcare organizations who are going to be impacted by that access to the data really at their fingertips in a new way. Um, We've uh, made a lot of progress and work to integrate new data types in the HIE. In particular, we're working with the designated agencies across the state to start to integrate part two data. Um, and that has been a really exciting project for us. As you know, that data is protected by more than the traditional HIPAA guidelines, but also by 42 CFR part two. And really the way we're phasing this project in is first really taking the data in and not making it available externally, but making sure we can get it in and protect it in the ways that it needs to be kind of protected and tagged with the goal that as um, the new form of 42 CFR Part 2, which is out in a draft form now and expected to be finalized by, by the end of the calendar year is in place, we'll be able to put the appropriate controls in place to share that data as appropriate um, under the new rules and kind of integrate that with the healthcare data that we have for a more complete patient record. Um, so we're excited to do some of that work in that planning there. Um, We've started work uh, around designing and thinking about making APIs available or application programming interfaces, which will be new ways for accessing the data in the HIE that should make it more accessible to a larger audience of the appropriate individuals to have access to it, but to get the data more accessible into apps and places where people want to see the data. Uh, Sue will spend a little time later in the presentation giving you just a little um, foundation on what APIs are because it's something you'll hear us talking about in future presentations. And it'll be a lot of the work that we'll be doing over the next year is to make those accessible. Um, other work has been um, with the Department of Health really looking at some HIE data that we have um, and how robust the data we have on race, ethnicity, and language and sexual orientation and gender identity are. Um, really, this year has been evaluation work to understand what we have, what we're receiving, how consistent it is, to then work with um, Department of Health and likely healthcare organizations about making sure that we have consistent and robust and complete data to help then inform some of the um, the public health uses of the data, but also hopefully then to uh, um, and have more robust data for other purposes too, to understand health equity uh, across different populations. Um, We've upgraded our platform. We've continued to build new interfaces to get data into the HIE, and we've transitioned our security program to um, a more rigorous standard. So that doesn't change our security practices. We have very robust security practices, but puts more rigor and formality around some of our, our program and planning. 
So going to the next slide, just to give you a sense of how this turns out for um, end of year financially, is we do expect to perform uh, higher than budget for the year. Um, so to end up with more of a surplus than we intended. A lot of this was due to timing on projects and when we're recognizing some revenue or pushed off some projects because some were made a priority earlier in the year. Um, so it's transitioned when some of our revenues come in and when, when some of our ex, um, expenses actually occur in the year. But as we'll get to a few slides later, we would like to ask to reinvest those monies into a project that is pretty critical to our work. And we're excited to have the monies to be able to do some of that. So then moving to fiscal year 24. So um, really uh, what I'll start with is giving you a, some context on the contract that we have, um, the draft contract we have in place with Department of Vermont Health Access that is with CMS for consideration that will drive the budget for the year. So starting with the next slide, um, just some context that I think is helpful when thinking about our budget. You're used to seeing our budget done on a fiscal year basis, which is July 1 through June 30 for each year, but doing a contract with GIVA for a calendar year, which was January through December. This is the first year that we're actually changing. We um, because it aligns both with the state and vitals fiscal year, um, we've been able to change the contract to actually align with the fiscal year instead of calendar year. So we've actually completed a, an FY24 budget that is based on a contract that is, while still draft because it's with CMS for their final review and approval, is a complete year budget. So, you know, less of the you're used to us coming with an amendment mid-year because we didn't know what the second half of the year for sure was going to look like. There's a little more certainty in the budget here, we hope. Um, and what the contract we expect will look like for this year is a uh, total potential for almost 11.3 million in revenue. But what you'll see represented in the budget that I'm presenting is really about 9.4 million in revenue. There's an additional almost 2 million in projects that are um, less clear about the real scope and timing of what the goal is, but there is the potential for demand for additional projects, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we haven't included those projects in the budget that's being presented because it would be really hard to put um, in some cases to really understand the cost because we don't have clear requirements or understand if the need for it will happen in this year or potentially future. Um, so the contract and the budget will have different amounts in them. Going to the next slide gives you a sense of the, the projects that are actually included in the budgeted numbers for our development work. So you're used to our contracts. They contain both a component that is for uh, what we call MNO maintenance and operations, which is the cost to operate the HIE license, the platform that the HIE operates on, the, the MPI tools and the integration engine, all of those pieces. And then to provide the kind of support that we need to provide to the healthcare organizations in getting the data in, making sure the data is flowing, get new people onboarded to using the tools um, and training about how to use the tools. And then we have what's called the DDI project, the development design and implementation work. And those are the projects to build new capabilities and functionality. And so there's about $3.2 million uh, in the contract for FY24 for that work. And that includes things like creating APIs, which is, as I mentioned earlier, will be making data and the HIE more accessible to um, providers and healthcare organizations also potentially using to collect data into the HIE in different ways. We'll continue to build interfaces to get more and new data in to the HIE. Um, in addition to the traditional providers, or what I'll term as traditional providers that we've worked with, um, the state is also, um, I'm sure you, you, you've you heard in these conversations and in others, um, implementing a, what they're calling the MDAP program, the Medicaid Data Access and Access uh, Aggregation and Accessibility pro um, Project, which is really seeking to enable more providers who maybe weren't eligible for some of the funding programs through the state or CMS in the past to get access to health information technology. So to get EHRs and tools in their practices and, and operations to support their work, and then to be able to connect to the HIE. So we're hoping to be able to connect some of those organizations who might not have been able to take advantage of participating in the HIE in the past engaged in our work. Um, We'll be doing some work with the Medicaid agency and AHS to support some of their initiatives and, and needs internally for access to data. Um, we are going to continue the work that I mentioned about uh, integrating healthcare organizations to the immunization registry right from their EHR. So we've piloted with one organization. The goal is to work with many more organizations throughout the next year to get them that capability. Um, 
we're going to work with the VDH to get more lab reporting in. So one thing we learned through the pandemic is um, we do get information about the, the test results that are happening at organizations, both the hospitals and commercial laboratories uh, are across the state. And we've been delivering that data for COVID results, but they have a lot of diseases that are required to be reported. And our goal is to try to collect more of that data for them so it gets them in, that data in a more timely manner and also saves healthcare organizations from having to submit the data to multiple entities and, and locations. So hopefully we can streamline some of that reporting. Um, we have a couple smaller projects with VDH to do. One will be a continuation of the race, ethnicity, race, ethnicity and language and the SOGI work that I mentioned earlier. Um, additional support for that MDAP project. There's some supports needed by the organizations that might take advantage of getting health technology, specifically around doing some security risk assessments and analysis that our team is um, performed with other organizations in the past. We'll be, we'll be supporting some of that need going forward. Um, we will continue our work to get new data types into the HIE and making sure that we can actively secure it. So that includes the continuation of the work with the designated agencies to get more of their data in and then secure it and identify, identify the appropriate opportunities to share it out. Um, and then also getting some social determinants of health data in there and working with um, agency of human services for some data from, from there. Finally, um, we'll be looking at enhancing the provider portal that we have with some medication fill capabilities. So that's a way of providers getting information, not just on what's been prescribed to a patient, but what, what medications they've actually potentially filled. We can't tell them they've taken them, but at least they've gone and purchased the medication and hopefully we can get some of that data out to them. Finally, we'll continue work, uh, which has been on our contract for a couple of years to work with by state to continue the work that they do for the Mont Rural Health Association's um, activities and quality improvement efforts. And so that will be in our contract and we will subcontract with by state to perform that work. So then just going to the next slide, just to give you a quick sense of the what the projects are that aren't included in our budget, but could potentially become projects during the year. Is there space to do up to 125 additional interfaces for those organizations that are under the MDAP program who are new? So the, the contract itself uh, allows for, uh, I think, 150 in new interfaces to be built, and this would allow to expand that number for another 125. That would actually be done through contractors that we would use to do the work, not vital staff, because we will be fully um, fully focused on the work that I just went through, um, but we do want to leave the potential to, to get as much data and as many organizations engaged as possible. Um, and finally, there's some space to potentially do additional work for the Medicaid program and some of their work on their um, information systems internally and getting data available to them, sharing the, our patient index so they can do some matching of patient records, things like that. Um, that's work that is we don't know timing on that work and actual scope. And so the, that's the reason that that's not included. And then there's a task order, which is typical in our contracts with AHS for things that might come up during the year, at least flexibility to take on a new project or expand scope of a project if and as needed. So moving to the next slide, this all rolls up into um, uh, the budget, which I'm sorry, I realize it is small here, but the 24 budget, which is outlined in red, um, which brings us kind of net um, kind of surplus at the end of the year of $78,000. So what you'll see reflected in here are um, just kind of, I'll go through a couple of slides which break down some of the information so you don't just have to stare at numbers here, but moving to the next slide to give you a sense of the revenue sources that are in here in addition to the 6.3 million that we talked about, 6.1 of that is the maintenance and operations of so supporting the day-to-day the -day operation of the HIE. 3.2, as we just walked through, is those, those DDEI, design development implementation projects. We do have deferred revenue for some projects that haven't been completed that we will be completing, kind of carrying forward some, some revenue, kind of an accounting um, activity in there to, to support some of the work going into the next year. And then the other contracts that we tend to have in place is we do custom reporting um, and data extracts for one care. We do some work with patient ping. Um, we have a HISP that some organizations take advantage of. And um, we have included a slight negative allowance for revenue, knowing that a number of our contracts are under negotiation now and what we hope they end up, where we expect them to end up, there is the possibility that we won't continue with some of them or that they will, the scope will change. And so that's just allowing a little bit of room for knowing that there may be some shifts in that revenue, the projected revenues. 
Next two slides just give a little bit of a sense of some of our bigger um, expense components, right? Staffing is a significant expense for us. It's about 38% of our budget, and this is staff that work across both the MO work and the development work. Um, the budget for this year does contemplate creating one new position in technology to support some of the new capabilities that we're putting in place that need some new specific skills that we don't have on the team. And then the next slide gives a sense of the software expenses and software really includes purchases of software, but a lot of this much more frequently now is licensing of platforms or software. So the core HIE platform, some of the business operational needs that we have, the master patient index results delivery tool. And so just to give a sense of the component, so looking at the software expenses, the gray section on the left is really the core components of the HIE. Um, and the cost for those components themselves. And then we break down what the, the orange is really what's associated with project work. So the, the DDI or the enhancements and then the business software we have, things like project management software and accounting software, things like that. Outside support um, tries to do a similar breakdown. So this is where we use um, potentially consultants, expert, um, at, subject matter experts, we need additional support just to have more hands to get some of the development work done, which isn't long-term um, staffing needs that we have. And that breaks down um, the blue bar here or blue slice here is really the operational or the more day-to-day -day support that we have. And that also includes things like legal and accounting, um, work like that. And then the, the work to support the projects is about 2 million. And that's not just, I, just, I should be clear about how I said that. It's not, it's not just staffing. So some of that may be contract staffing, but in addition, that will also be, if we have consultants helping us, like a consulting firm helping us with a project or something like that. The next two slides, I won't spend a lot of time on because I don't think there's much there, but I'm of course always happy to answer questions. This just gives a sense of the indirect rate and the consistency. So the blue bars are really the indirect costs that we have. Those are things, administrative cost, insurance, um, general things to operate the business relative to the overall budget. And then the next slide um, gives a sense of our balance sheet assets, which you'll see um, the, the right bar is the projected for the end of 24. And we're projecting a decrease in balance sheets assets. And that is because we're, we're asking to reinvest some funds into our project, which I will talk about just in, in the next slide. Um, so that is our core operational budget for 24. But one additional thing we are hoping to be able to do is take 600, up to 650,000 of surplus that we've had in prior years, so our cash balance in, in, in reality, to, um, to build a cap or to rebuild a capability that is pretty critical to our work. And it is a message archive, which will really help us complete the transition from our legacy infrastructure to the this new platform we've had envisioned. And just for context, what the message archive does is really, I mean, it, it does kind of what it sounds like. And we get messages consistently from healthcare organizations. And these are their ADTs and CCDs, the messages that have the healthcare data in them. And you've heard us talk about the work that we do. We do do a lot of work to um, improve those messages. So we match them. So we can say this patient from this organization is also this patient from this organization, put that record together into a record. We standardize codes. So where you might use a local code and a, and a practice, we standardize it to more nationally accepted code sets. So again, data can be compared across the organizations. Well, what we do is we maintain a store of the raw, raw messages that come in up front, and we use that store for um, a lot of our operational and data quality support. Um, really gives us a chance if something goes wrong or looks funky in the system where we get questions to understand a little, you know, what's in a patient record. We can always go back to the core message and see what the data looked like there. Um, was there a problem in the way the data was submitted? Was there a problem somewhere along the way in our pipeline? And it's a, it's a functionality that's used pretty, pretty frequently for us to make sure that we're maintaining good data quality in the HIE. It also does track the changes that have happened to a message so we can see along the way where all the transformations happened. It also serves as a backup store for, of data for us. So should something happen at our vendor, it's you know kind of worst case scenario, it's a data backup, but it also allows us to replay messages. So if we do find that there's an error, you know, we'll, you know, the healthcare organization might have a problem in a feed to us. We can delete the messages that they sent and replay them through um, to, to make sure we have a good set of data in the HIE. And we think, you know, I think there's 
more advanced capabilities we can use off of message archiver in the future, but that is kind of at its core why we need it now. now um, next slide, please, Maureen. So we want to make this investment um, because the interest, the message archive we have now is built on internal infrastructure that we've had at the HIE. You've probably heard in the past referenced as the HDM, the Health Data Mart, um, and it's built on old hard. It's built on what was new, but is now old and um, end of life hardware and software that we really need to replace it. And part of the the impetus behind the move to the new Firebase MedicaSoft platform over the past couple of years was to replace much of the functionality that existed on that health data mart. We did our client reporting off of that platform. That's all moving onto the MedicaSoft platform. But this message archive is kind of that one of those last components that it was doing. We, our original plan thought we could do what's called a lift and shift of that um, capability from the old hardware onto a cloud-based infrastructure. Um, to have the same capabilities. But after more kind of planning and evaluation of the state of that infrastructure and then the needs that we have for that in the future, for that message archive and how we really want to use it in our day-to-day -day operations, realize it really needs a rebuild rather than just a shift to the cloud, which is a more expensive project than we had anticipated. Um, and so what we'd like to do is use the 650,000 in surplus that we've had from, from our, our our work in the past couple of years to build this infrastructure, will, which will allow us to continue to um, to continue our work on data quality and improving the the the, the data availability uh, and and accessibility in the HIE. So that takes us through the budget. I'm going to stop for just a moment. I sometimes you have sometimes we stop here for questions and sometimes we wait till the end. So I just want to check before I just go flying through the rest of the presentation. I think it's fine to just continue on. Um, we're pretty well trained to let people go through their whole presentation at this point, so that's that's totally fine. Great, thank you. Well, I'm taking us to maybe some more of the fun conversation instead of just the numbers. Um, wanted to just give a little context on. Um, the work at the HIE and how some of that is changing for us here in Vermont, but also kind of on a national level and how HIEs are emerging from a traditional model of really just moving healthcare data, pushing ADTs and basic um, patient records back and forth between healthcare organizations and making that available to really becoming what's, what's being kind of termed as a data utility or a health data utility is a phrase that's starting to be used on more of a national level around that. Um, and it's really a very different um, operating model for, for traditional HIEs, really looking at working with new partners. So not just health, and I don't mean to minimize any of this, but not just the healthcare organizations, but the new work with public health, working with payers, working around care coordination, and really trying to support and inform other efforts in some of the work. And I just think it's it's um, a good context for us to have as we think about this budget and and the HIE plan and some of the work you're going to see for vital for this year, but also in future years, is really moving us here into this new model of really serving as a health data utility and really serving new stakeholders and more stakeholders across the state, um, hopefully meeting some new use cases and really doing things here. You know, we, we do some things here in Vermont that are very different from how HIEs or health data utilities in other states work that I think is really interesting and, and you know, want to just bring some attention to, right? The way that we really treat our data and focus on the making the data that we get accessible for lots of different purposes, the way we, you know, we, we don't just pass messages from healthcare organizations, but we dig into them to pull out data elements that are important to some of the stakeholders who are using the HIE data for reporting and extracts in their work within our patient portal to make it really have a like clean front page that you can have a snapshot of a patient is work that doesn't happen in other organizations. The partnership that we have with some of the stakeholders, particularly the data that we do provide for quality improvement efforts and population health activities across the state is really important to the work that we do. Um, and really just wanted to kind of introduce the model of like what this starts to look like it has health data utility because I think this is language we'll start to see and some of the federal work that's happening you know as CDC is talking about some of their funding and and encouraging um, 
Department of Health to work with their HIEs and their health data utilities and their work and, and, and some of the programs that are going to come out of CMS are going to start using some of this language. So I just wanted to kind of introduce this and kind of give you some context for how this aligns with the work we're doing here in Vermont. And I think as I turn it over to Christina to talk about some of the work in the bi-directional uh, interface, you'll hear uh, a bit about some of that and how we're working differently um, with new partners. So with that, Christina, do you sure. mind? Thank you. Not at all. So uh, as Beth said, we have implemented a bi-directional immunization dating, data sharing service, and we just launched it this uh, April between the Department of Health and uh, our first organization, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. Uh, and that enables the ability for clinicians and staff at NVRH to query for patients' comprehensive immunization records, get all of that history right from inside their EHR. So as you can imagine, they get a more complete picture of their patient and a more efficient workflow in the fact that right within their EHR, they can get this information, it's transparent to them, they don't need to sign into uh, a separate uh, system, this being the immunization registry. And through this effort, we have uh, partnered with the Department of Health in order to, to participate in the Association of State and Tribal Health Organizations, their Immunization Data Exchange Advancement and Sharing Learning Community, also known as IDEAS. And so it's been a great partnership in that we've been able to, through this collaborative, share information not only with, with ASTO, the uh, collaborative, but also to get information back, especially as we move on to rolling the service out to other organizations. Uh, which, next slide, please. So we are moving on to additional hospitals in order to roll this out, um, the federally qualified health centers and other independent practices um, to enable this uh, to more providers throughout the state. Uh, we are currently uh, in communication with over nine EHR vendors um, to roll this out to those organizations. And the exciting part of this is that the Department of Health hasn't stopped with just uh, providing the immunization health history through the service that VITAL has set up between the organizations and the immunization registry, but they're also rolling out this summer the forecasting capability, meaning once the provider has the immunization histories, they can also query and receive back. This is what the patients need to now receive for vaccination. So very exciting work. And that work will continue in fiscal year 24 as we partner with the Department of Health, these organizations, and learn more about the capabilities of these vendors. Before I hand it off to Sue regarding the next topic, any questions? Great, I'll be happy to answer at the end as well. So I think what we wanted to do is spend a little bit of time. I'm sure everybody has heard the three letter acronym APIs and knows it stands for Application Programming Interface. But I think we wanted to spend a little bit of time because it is such a big part of our upcoming year, you know, making sure everybody understands the specific parts of APIs that make them important in our new world. Because of course we've had programming for a long time. So what is it about an API that makes it so special and why do we talk about it in this space? Um, so the what's of APIs are, it's code that enables interoperability. So if you're thinking about the, the ability of two systems to talk to one another and the pretty basic diagram that I have at the top of this. It's, it's, it's allowed us, this application programming interface has allowed us to make connections over the internet between multiple systems, whether it's a client-based system trying to connect to a web server and a backend database or two different systems connected over the internet. It is, that, it is that type of infrastructure that allows us to make those connections and exchange information. Um, the way we do it is based on standards. So throwing out the buzzwords that you've heard or the buzz acronyms that you've heard of HTTP, HTTPS, of being able to use the web as its transport me mechanism. The fact that it's 
restful and it's using JSON and XML and in the healthcare industry fire. Those are all, those last four are all standards around how the data is formed and how it's transmitted in, across the internet um, with fire being the specific data standard in the healthcare and in industry. Um, the big piece of it, like I said, we've had programs forever. So what's so important about APIs? Well, it's because we moved away from this idea of creating this one big monolithic um, program to creating what we call microservices. And the microservices are smaller pieces of code that can be reusable. So um, thinking of an example of, you know, if I have an Apple Watch and I want to send my heart rate to my doctor, you know, there's a microservice somewhere within this API infrastructure that not only allows me to read data about patients, but it also uh, might allow me to write the data. And it, instead of creating a whole system for that Apple Watch, it's the same API that gets reused over and over again, despite what use case or what application is out there, whether it's an Android or whether it's an Apple Watch or whether it's a provider at a healthcare facility using some app inside their EHR, the same piece of small code could be reused over and over again to provide the interface for that application and get to the data from that application. Now, the whys of this, I think I'll turn over to Beth. Um, you know, it goes back to CMS and their their drive towards interoperability for healthcare. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the, um, I'm gonna say mandates, just as a broad reaching word um, that CMS has put out for healthcare organizations, for developers of certified health IT. So those are the people who make things like EHRs um, and, for, and for the federal funded payers. So Medicaid, Medicare is to really um, make patient data available to the patients and the ways that the patients want. And that data includes both their clinical data, maybe their claims data, um, might be provider lists that come from their health plans um, to make it accessible to apps that patients might use. And so the, the goals for these APIs at its core is really around patient access and getting that data that they want to kind of help manage and maintain their own care. Um, but it's also expanding out to making the data interoperable between healthcare organizations as well. So it might allow for us to exchange data with a hospital in Vermont or we might allow a hospital in Vermont to query the HIE specifically for the types of data they want or a subset of patients that they're interested in um, and really just allows more accessibility to the data than some of these um, bigger, harder extracts or feeds that we might have built in the past. So I think we'll see use of these going forward, not just in the patient space, but also with the healthcare organizations as well. Thanks. Sue, are you done? Should I pass Next it off? Slide. I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. We, we, I did want to compile a couple of the other um, terms just because you'll be hearing this type of terminology, which is a little bit heavy and technical. Um, like we talked about before, the FHIR, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. It's just a standard for the way we form the data. It helps drive towards consistency because everybody knows they're supposed to put the data in a certain format within certain tags inside of a document so that all computer systems can read them correctly. Um, then we have the Smart on FHIR and OAuth 2.0, which is the mechanism that we use to make sure that we have security and, and around the um, data, how people will get authenticated to that information and get a access and authorization to the specific levels of information that are appropriate for them. Then there's the standard of Open ID Connect, which we talk about, and this is over the top of OAuth 2. This is how we actually verify that Sue Fritz is really Sue Fritz. Um, and then grant her access to the system, not being sure that she's the right Sue Fritz. And then USCDI, which is the United States Core Data for Interoperability, another standard that we have around healthcare data for um, the types of elements that we're most interested in using. Thanks, Sue. All right. I'm just going to um, talk a little bit now about patient education and not um, any real major updates here, but just a reminder 
that um, VITAL is committed to ongoing patient education, first and foremost in partnership with the organizations that share data with us or who use the health data that VITAL provides. Um, we do that by giving them a toolkit of education resources that they can use um, in, their, in their portals, in their social media, um, in their notice of privacy practices and so forth, brochures, um, flyers translated into many languages. And then additionally, we're committed to direct outreach to Vermonters. And we um, ha had a campaign last year, um, reaching out to Vermonters primarily through um, YouTube and social channels. We are about to launch another campaign early this summer um, to reach out directly to Vermonters, sort of supplementing that, that work we do with their providers. Um, and you can plan on seeing sort of continuation of that throughout 2023. So starting with um, some social and likely newspaper in June and continuing with some other tactics uh, later in the year. We also, um, as part of this, update to the board, um, do quarterly metrics. This is part of the, the standard um, presentation here. So I want to just share a little bit about um, how much uh, data we're sharing with our partners, how much they are accessing it. First, we will talk about the percentage of Vermonters who are opted out of the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And as expected, this um, rate continues to drop as we get further away from that time when people were um, opting in rather than opting out, and we get lots more um, new patient identities incorporated into the health information exchange and fewer people opting out. Certainly, we do see a steady stream of folks um, reaching out to us one by one to opt out, but it's at a much lower rate than when everybody who shows up at a doctor's office is being asked, do you want to be in or do you want to be out? This is um, measuring queries of vital access, our uh, clinical portal by the organization type. So you can see how use of that clinical portal is distributed across the organizations um, that we offer it to. You'll see um, just some really interesting distribution here. Certainly we've got some hospitals using it. Certainly we've got um, independent practices relying on it actually at an even larger rate than hospitals or larger number than hospitals. Um, and then um, community health centers, really strong use as well by federal and state agencies. So here, the Vermont Department of Health features prominently, as does the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, the um, care coordination arm of Medicaid. Uh, and emergency medical services are relying on this tool as well. So um, lots of different types of organizations using our provider portal. This is queries over time, so you can see um, total volume. We're doing about, um, well, this past or the latest reporting month, March of 2023, 12,669 queries. And a query is um, measured as an access of a patient's chart up to once per hour or by organization. Um, so um, if somebody is going in a couple times within an hour, we don't count that if they're going in um, uh, twice in a day that that does get counted. Um, and certainly we can see some steady growth here over time. Next is queries of the Vermont Health Information Exchange via the eHealth Exchange um, network. Uh, this is on pause right now. We are establishing um, new connection through the eHealth Exchange hub. eHealth Exchange does not allow um, us to re-establish point-to-point -point connections. We had to reconnect through the hub. That technology is in place, but um, based on the national um, sort of data sharing environment, we are kind of re-entering this carefully, and we are planning on re-establishing connections with the University of Vermont Medical Center first, um, and then the VA and DOD. So results delivery, this is the service where we deliver lab results, radiology reports, and transcribed reports directly into the EHR of an ordering provider. So primary care provider orders a lab test. Behind the scenes, VITAL delivers that result into their EHR. Most of the 586 providers who are receiving these results don't even know that VITAL is, is doing this. Um, but there is a, a large volume of these results delivered every day and every month. Um, in March of 2023, over 100,000 results delivered. 
And then lastly, you can see um, the types of organizations that really rely on this service. And because the results are largely being um, calculated or the, the laboratory tests are happening at a hospital uh, typically or um, an independent lab, um, it's the federally qualified health centers and the independent practices who are ordering those tests and then receiving the results back into their EHRs. So real reliance um, by those two types of organizations on this service. And that's our quarterly metrics and, and our update for you. So I'm going to stop sharing um, for any questions and certainly we can go back to any slide if there's a particular one you want to focus on. I also, I'll just ask if you want me to do the HIE strategic plan change, like now or after questions, please. Just, what's easiest on your order? Um, see how we had it set up. Oh, we didn't. Um, why don't we do some questions now because they are kind of different topics. It might be easier to break it up a little Great. bit. Um, I'll open it up to my fellow board members to to go ahead with any questions or comments they may have. Um, well, I'll I'll go first. Um, I had a couple quick little easy ones. Um, I think Ms. Anderson, you said something about the effort that it takes to translate from local codes to national codes. I presume you mean from like laboratories, but like LabCorp's specific codes to LOINC codes, that kind of thing. Is that what you're referring to? It could be, or it could be codes, and Christina, you can, Christina is going to laugh at me and want to help, so I'll tell her she can. Um, but it could be that there, uh, an organization has local, just within an organization, ways of designating um, specific data elements um, that are, it, you know, male, female might be M or F, and we might change it to male, female, things like that. So it's, it's not always a lab code. It could be other types of information as well. Okay. Okay, and what's the scope of that issue? Is that I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of how much effort is involved in tr making those translations so they're all in the same language. Interesting, Chris, Christina, do you wanna? Yeah, I would say most of the effort is understanding what those codes in are that would come in the door through a message so that we can set up a way to map it to a standard code. Once you've set that standard, then it's automated from there. Occasionally, there may be a code that makes it through the door that even the organization um, was unaware that they were documenting. Sometimes it's think of like a fat finger situation where somebody just entered the wrong code. Other times it's historical codes that were used over time that now make it through. And again, we'll catch that work with the organization, determine what that right mapping should be to the right standard and set up uh, the automation for that. Okay. And you guys do that mapping and translation in-house? Like, for example, from if you get a bunch of NDCs, you then have a mapping process to translate it to Rx norm? We do. We have a way of doing those local codes to the standards. And again, it's um, we have uh, sheets that we've perfected over time working with organizations to make sure that we get to the right information very quickly and then automate that translation within our integration engine. We also use a, a third party terminology service engine that does more of the clinical concept mapping from a local code to a standard LOINC SNOMED, you know, those types of things. And, and again, once we have that mapping, it's automated. And we also use some of their um, already built in logic where it would know how to already do that mapping. Right, like the Walters Clore product or something like that, that kind of, and they change monthly, right? A lot of these. It's, it's, it's through our partner in Maine who offers this service. It's uh, the Maine HIE. They have a product that they use um, successfully and we use it as well. And we do um, roughly about 20 million insertions of mappings um, from uh, one code to another code set every month, automated. Obviously there's nobody behind the scenes doing them. <laughs> that's significant. Yeah. it's really significant. And we maintain, so back to uh, best uh, 
conversation about the message archive. Now you can see why it's important to know what came in the do door as the raw message. When we also enrich the message with the transformation, we keep the original as well as the uh, transformed so that we can troubleshoot as well. Is there any opportunity um, for the for anyone, the board or otherwise, to minimize those um, upstream challenges so that we are in a more uniform set of code so you don't have to do that much work? It's a really great question. I think um, some of this will come through with the mandates and with the standards that are being rolled out. And as more of the vendors and the organizations mature, they will send more of the standard codes. Again, sometimes the content may not still match with the expectation of what code should be used simply because of, again, historical information and frankly, the capability of the vendors, those who are certified EHR technology, we expect to see some improvement over time, but also standards change and we might need to map from one standard to another standard in the future. Think of ICD-9 to ICD-10. That's my short answer. Okay. Um, Slide 21, you talked, you spoke about the immunization records and ability of um, a hospital to, to get those from you. Um, and I think it was Northeastern Vermont Medical Center, is that right? North, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital, yes. NVRH, right. And why is it, is it just NVRH or can we expand this beyond NVRH or is this... That is the plan. Our first, um, we've been saying pilot, but it truly is our first organization that we rolled it out with um, was NVRH. And so uh, learning through them, learning through their vendor, they do now have that capability. And the data comes from the Vermont Immunization Registry. Vital is the go between allowing the technical capability from the EHR vendor. We check the structure of the message, the content to make sure that once it goes into the immunization registry, it can very quickly come back because it's got all of the necessary uh, information in it. And yes, we are already working with several organizations and those nine plus EHR vendors to begin rolling this out to more organizations um, throughout the um, fiscal year, as well as this summer. And is it is there any plans to broaden it beyond immunizations to diagnoses or prescriptions or or labs or anything of that nature? We do have a um, project with the Department of Health now where um, organizations can submit data to the Department of Health. I think that there's through this learning collaborative and through a partnership with VDH, there is the opportunity to expand beyond what we offer now and, and consider that in the future, other ways to get more data back into the hands of providers. Right, what I'm sort of envisioning is I go to a hospital and um, for whatever reason they wanna know what, it's not my usual hospital, and they wanna check what my meds are, what my family history is, to do that now, would they be able to, I guess it's my first question, They'd be able to use the, the data that we have in the VHI without the public health data. So through our Perfect. provider portal being a really good example of how that would happen, they could log into the portal, they could look up the patient and see the patient's record. And that would have, in theory, depending on what we what's in their record, what we've received, information about um, their allergies, the medications they use, conditions, um, things like that. We are actively working in different ways to get that data to the hands of providers so so it can be more available in their EHR and not in a separate application and that's some of the focus of like this API work that we'll be doing uh, to start to enable some of that. Um, okay. This is a rudimentary question so I apologize if it's just really not that exciting of a question but why does a hospital or an EMR have to go through an HIE as opposed to directly with another EMR or another hospital? I'm gonna give you the short answer. Um, 
we could t we of course could talk about this all day because it's what we do. Um, but it's really because we enable that interoperability that doesn't necessarily exist now. So we handle the patient matching. So we know the MRN from the hospital matches the patient's MRN at the local practice. They wouldn't know that necessarily. So we and we we don't just know that. We have tools that actually allow, even if the address was coming in different for that patient, but we know some other demographic information that we can match up to put that record together. We standardize the code so they, you know, the local code set that the practice uses, if the practice uses M for male, like sure, most people could figure out what that means, but their system wouldn't necessarily know how to translate it if they're capturing sex as male instead of M. And so that's really where we add the value is the, the curating the data to make it more standardized um, so they can actually ingest it in their system. Systems. Other pieces, I'm sorry, uh, stop me where you want to stop me, but other pieces are they don't necessarily store the data in the same places or call the elements the same things. And so we do a lot of that standardization to say the diagnosis code, this is the diagnosis code, call it that. And this is the diagnosis code, call it that. So it all ends up in the same place and can be used. That's really helpful. Thank you. Is that a good start? Answer. Okay. No, great. Thank you. And my last question um, was on the patient education, I think was mentioned around slide 25. A um, couple questions. One, what is that education, patient education, or where does it come from? Sure. So the patient education is designed to help patients understand how their data is being shared, uh, with whom, for what purposes. Um, that is developed by um, our team at Vital in collaboration with, with some vendors, some communications vendors, um, and then distributed through the participating organizations and then through some direct outreach that, that we do typically annually now. I see. Okay. It's not like clinical patient education, like, hey, oh, and you're 44, you need a colonoscopy soon. Not that kind of thing. No, and, that, and that's a really interesting question, and, and it is different than than what we do, which is really about the data sharing and awareness of the data sharing. Right. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Oh, and can I just piggyback on that for a quick second? Please. I'm just wondering, uh, thank you so much for the presentation today. As always, informative. Um, and it's nice to see a surplus so that you'll be able to reinvest. That's good news. Um, I guess I'd, I just wanted to ask if it's possible in your next, you know, re reporting back to us or, you know, your next visit with us, if you might be able to share some of the samples of, of that public education outreach, you know, whether it's through the social media, like, you know, what what that looked like. I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how you're explaining how the data is being used and shared mm -hmm. and with whom and why. Um, and my other request was the next time you come in, I am also very interested in learning more about the work that you're doing on the social determinants of health. Um, you know, I know that's for implementation in, in fiscal year 24, but between now and then, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of progress made on it. So maybe a bit of a deeper dive into that because health equity is such an important issue here at the board. And so understanding um, what the progress on that front would be really helpful. So more, my comments are more about n next time you come in, these are things I'd love to hear about in, in, in greater detail, if that's okay. But fantastic, and thank you very much today. Thank you, it's great to know what you wanna hear about. I'll go ahead and jump in. I um, was wondering, and this could also be, you know, an update. It doesn't have to be now, but I'd be interested in understanding a little bit better um, your how you're supporting Blueprint and Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, and um, where the various end user services are in terms of development. Like who's using what? What you know? Just a little bit more detail on that component. Right. Why don't we, um, we could, rather than hit some topics today, like, can we come back with that? Because I think it might be helpful for us to work with those organizations to, to, because we can give you some context of what we provide, but then also why, right? Instead of just, oh, we send them this, which might not be helpful to understand the, the impacts or the value. That works for me yeah. if that's, if that's cool with the chair. Perfectly reasonable. Oh, sure. Yep, yeah, of course. My my only comment is it's it's interesting. It's it's 
this this work is clearly a, a mixture of exciting new technology with these um, APIs and re envisioning how healthcare, you know, health information is going to be structured and used in the future with incredibly like detailed, the diligent, probably tedious information of you know, making sure every little thing in this massive database lines up. So it, it it's um I imagine at times it's it's very cerebral and engaging of the big process, but also like, you know, it, clearly um a lot of care and diligence goes into the work. Um and I think one of the things I I gleaned from the presentations that I've seen from you so far is that really in the current state this is a hugely important resource for FQHCs and independent practices and how they get laboratory data and com can communicate um, with each other. And I, I think that, um, but but and I think we've had these conversations before that I, I kind of piggyback a little bit on the Owen's um, interest as, you know, as a provider, you know, if say, Sheriff Foster came to my emergency department and hadn't uh, been there before, or that's not his normal hospital of some way that I could access his information uh, in his chart in front of me, which I know that that this is sort of a complicated issue of, of so many players kind of working together to, to get that information to the provider, but just to continue to advocate for that stance that I, that I think having providers to be able to have access to patients information within the EHR that they are using is sort of my my dream to where this would go. And I think many people share that dream. I see Christina nodding um, quite vigorously there <laughs> saying so. Um, the, the one other, the one question actually I, I had, which is sort of not really even uh, health IT related in your in your budget, what and we get a we get a lot of public comment um, from small businesses. Uh, on the costs of health insurance and the impact to their budget. And I, I saw that you had put that sort of in there, but is that, I was just wondering if you could comment on the impact of, of the cost of insuring your employees as a line item in your budget over time and, and how that has been for you to, to, to manage. Um, that is a great question, Bob. Bob probably can talk best about history, but I'll start, Bob, to not put you on the spot, but please feel free to um, to correct me here. I, like any other provider, it, you know, it increases every year. Um, we are on the exchange. You know, we, we purchase our insurance through the exchange. Um, we do provide pretty good, I, I would say, actually very robust um, health insurance benefits for our staff and their families. Um, and, and that's been an important, um, important piece of our our benefits as a nonprofit, we think that's a really, you know, that's that's an area where we feel like it's important to um, to focus on. Um, but it's consistently rises every year, and we um, do a mix of um, a higher deductible, which we cover for employees, right? Because in the end, it actually ends up um, a lower cost for us than the full premium, typically. Um, but it, I would say the past, you know, the, I mean, you know, you, you approve them. The premiums are rising, you know, 10, 12% each year. And that comes right to us. We, our employees um, contribute a small piece of their premiums, but we do cover the, the majority of it and it hits vitals line. Bob, would you like to, as a numbers guy, outgoing uh, numbers guy? I, I just have to um, support what Beth ha has said. Um, certainly during my tenure, if you We've seen it um, rise um, during that period. And as Beth mentioned, we've taken a number of tax. We, uh, we have switched underwriters. Um, we have switched plans um, to try to keep things um, in check, but um, it'll, you know, ongoing, it'll be a challenge. Thanks. Thanks for addressing that. If, if I could just um, piggyback off of this um, conversation a little bit, the uh, in my prior work, working in organizations where working with providers and working with the IT department, 
Um, from a provider standpoint, <clears throat> what we really want in order to be able to better manage our contribution to healthcare costs is to understand our patients. And what I'd really like to know as a primary care provider, <clears throat> if I was one, was how many patients of mine have diabetes and how many of those have their diabetes is poorly controlled. And then of those patients, what proportion haven't I seen in the last six months? Because the guidelines are see them every six months. And I know the patients who come less frequency, less frequently, or it may appear erratic or, or chaotic. Those aren't good words to describe what's going on, but they get used in healthcare a lot. That those those patients um, often have other comorbidities, right? They may have um, mental health comorbidities or they're the social determinants of health that, that Jessica mentioned. They may have transportation difficulties. Um, they may have, um, they may be in and out of the workforce seasonally, right? There are all kinds of things that can go into that that make it difficult for me to manage, which those patients, are the ones that end up using the emergency department in unplanned ways, or they get admitted to the hospital. And if I could better understand their needs, I could maybe redesign my interventions. And so to have that as a backdrop and then talk with IT folks, and we realize that, gosh, to get that information about people, we need to merge a lot of data sets. And we need to think about how we're going to store that data and how we're going to design governance around the management of the data and how we're going to analyze it, how we're going to get it back to the provider. And we can go from one conversation to the next. And, and at the end of the day, the provider is still saying, I just, I just want to know how many of my patients have poorly controlled diabetes. Then we can work through the rest. And so um, I think I mentioned this in one of the last um, meetings that we had. You have wonderful presentations and you're, you're managing your budget really well. And the microservices idea that you talked about today really fascinates me. The upgrading that you're, that you're doing in order to be able to better manage the different data sets, all wonderful. Um, but I just encourage you to keep really trying to focus on how do we get that number two clinicians what proportion of my patients have diabetes? What proportion is poorly controlled? Who hasn't been seen in the past six months? And if an organization can do that for the top 10 ambulatory care sensitive conditions, those are the organizations that regardless of the payment model, they're going to succeed because they're able to find the patients who are most likely to become costly and better manage that. And, and the service that you folks are providing is the service that can help the clinicians do it. But really having that end user idea in mind, ambulatory care sensitive conditions that are poorly controlled, how do we get that information to clinicians? Um, that's just, that's it's really hard. I don't know any place that does it consistently great, but, um, just, I, I'm just trying to advocate for um, really focusing in on that with everything that you do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just I keep, doing, keep doing the great job you're doing, um, but really try to be able to tell me what proportion of my patients have diabetes. That is, and thank you for bringing that up. That is definitely we hear that and and we understand that. And some of the work that we're, we're we've got planned, this message archive and some of the APIs are hopefully building blocks to be able to do some of that and make that data available at the point of care. So I'm not promising that's happening in the next four months, but it is building towards that. Right, we're taking our yeah. first steps to this year have. Um, a dashboard, which is more about data completeness as a first step for organizations. So before we can start telling you, or before we want to start representing to you, like we're sure we have the data and this about your patient. Hey, here's what you submitted to us. Does this really jive with what you think you submitted? Is there more data you should be submitting so we can have a more complete picture? And then building from there, um, sharing with organizations more dashboards into the data. So it's absolutely something we have. We're, we, we're, we're going to start taking some steps on this year. 
great. And and the work you just mentioned, you can't skip, right? It's so so it, it's in those are important steps. And so good job and and keep going. Um, does the healthcare advocate have any questions or comments on this? Uh, thank you. We just 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 a few. Um, you know, the work on APIs is really interesting. I think, at least in other fields, and obviously it's different in healthcare um, and with fire data. But you know, there are some really interesting use cases that I think you couldn't have predicted that people would use the data or use the API in the way that it's intended. And I think at least personally, I've sometimes heard about those and that it's changed how I'm approaching the project. So I'm thinking like really early examples of how folks were using calls to the um, NY City data repository, right? Like, yeah, you know, that was really interesting to hear. Like there was all these ways that people were using this urban planning data that wasn't expected, right? Like we couldn't have thought that people would use these standardized calls in that way. Or for instance, most recently, like thinking about how web developers are using the API that was developed, that was put out by Heroku, right? Like you couldn't have expected some of these uses, right? And then you're looking around and trying to put something together and like, oh my God, that's a great idea. I should use the API in this way. And obviously it's different in the healthcare space, um, but I think that would be an interesting thing to track and a kind of within bounds moving the, beyond just interoperability of EHRs, but really getting at innovation around looking at the social determinants of health and how we're incorporating uh, equity thinking. Um, it would be really interesting to say, um, and, uh, Chair Foster, I just wanted to say weird. So, without the um, kind of ethical problems, perhaps, at least, and in the kind of criminal law enforcement context, weirdly, it's sometimes useful to think of to look at Palantir and Vital. So, really, without the ethical issues, I want to be clear here. Like, we can have our own judgments on Palantir and what they do, but I think it the the role and the insights that data standardization and interoperability can do. Um, Palantir is an interesting use case for that, uh, all other issues aside. And then lastly, I know I just want to say this because there are so many new board members. Uh, Vital's efforts at um, community outreach and really translating rather complex ideas in an understandable way is they're take very seriously in my opinion and you know it's i think it's a interesting to look at as several board members have raised about how as an example for how you can communicate quite complex ideas in a accessible format thank you so much thank you um no I echo what uh, Mr. Schultes said about your ability to translate this for uh, lay folk. So I appreciate that. Um, and I believe you have some additional uh, material to cover, which we'll go through before we do public comment. Thank you. I'm sorry. You'll be done with me soon. This should be. Uh, yeah, while you're pulling that up, uh, I'll jump in. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Kate O'Neill. I'm the Director of uh, Data An Analytics here at the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, so uh, I am chiming in because this is related to a proposed amendment to the HIE plan. Beth and her and the vital team will talk through uh, a, a change that they propose, um, but it is a mid-year change to the state's HIE plan, which you approved back in December. Um, and it's related to Appendix A. So I just uh, wanted to um, co come on first to let you know that this is part of the process, right? So um, if there's a mid-year change to the HIE plan per statute, the uh, board um, 
will contemplate the change and uh, and and vote on approval for it. So I'm um, here to let you know that the HIE steering committee has reviewed this change and uh, did vote to to approve it. So now it moves to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I think, Beth, and I'll stop here. There's no vote on this today. This is just for you to uh, to learn about and to, uh, and to understand, ask questions about. Uh, and then uh, at the end of May, along with the vote for the budget, uh, you'll vote on this proposed amendment. So Beth, I'll turn it over to you to explain the change and the rationale for it. Thanks. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, one thing Steam doesn't tell you is it's actually showing. Um, so thank you, Kate, for the introduction. Just going to stress again, I'm I'm asking for this request, which was approved by the HIE steering committee last month. So I'm, it's gone through process. The committee had a long discussion about this change and approved it to come forward. Um, and so just a quick context setting. You, you approve the HIE strategic plan on an annual basis. Appendix A of that plan, and while the plan sets out goals for what we want to do, functionality, capabilities, what direction we want to go, Appendix A really lays out protocols for access to protected health information on the VHI, right? That's the name of it. And it really does um, set standards for who can have access. Now, that Appendix A is you, is um, guidance is also used in conjunction with the services agreements we have in place with the healthcare organizations that follow kind of traditional um, business associate um, HIPAA TPO use, or I'm sorry, I won't use acronyms, treatment payment operations um, access to the healthcare data and also subject to the patient consent, right? First and foremost, that would, that's what drives our sharing of the data. Um, but but this really is protocols that change on an annual basis as we learn new, new capabilities or types of data that we might wanna have in the HIE and, and this morphs. And so one change that was included um, with in November was to enable us to participate in some, uh, or to, to represent that we do participate in some national exchange. So there's an organization that's eHealth Exchange that we participate in, a lot of HIEs and healthcare organizations participate in, and they facilitate sharing of healthcare data across organizations. So it's another way that we can make patient data accessible. We traditionally have worked with the eHealth Exchange to make the, the VHI data available to, and you heard Maureen talk about this a bit before, to UVM. And so they've been able to, within their Epic instance, actually access um, VHI data about their patients. So again, they don't have to log into our portal. They can pull up some, some patient information in, in within their EHR. And also to the... Um, the Veterans Association and the Department of Defense for their medical operations. So it's not for their general operations, but it's for the health care that they provide to veterans or um, active military. And it, it's within their, it's called a joint HAE or JHI. And we've had that link directly before, but the new model for um, eHealth Exchange treats it differently on a hub model. And we wanted to protect and continue that work with UVM, the VA, and DOD. And so included in the change to the Appendix A in November, that capability. But the world has changed a lot and, and eHealth Exchange, um, their model has changed significantly. And we um, the real goal for them is interoperability and opening access for healthcare data more broadly, right? National exchange, and this aligns with ONC and HHS guidance at the federal level. We also know that changes to some laws in many states around reproductive and, and um, gender affirming care has maybe put risk with sharing some data in, in different states. Uh, it's changed the risk. It's changed the calculation. And so we don't want at this point, um, we want to continue that work with EVM, VA and DOD, but we don't want to open up access to the HIE data to other organizations until we can have some really thoughtful conversations with the HIE steering committee and participants and patients across the state to understand what people are comfortable with. We also want to see what's happening on a national level, right? Um, HHS has issued a notice of public rulemaking for changes to the HIPAA privacy rule around reproductive data. And we want to see what that what that means to us and what the how that changes, how how that data needs to be um, shared or accessed. And so we'd like to make this change to Appendix A, um, which will limit how we can share the data with eHealth Exchange. So it will protect us as an organization from any claims of information blocking or pressures we might get to share our data on a more national basis until we as a state 
if you get comfortable with our approach and what what is right and appropriate for um, sharing reproductive and, and gender affirming care data, um, and we'll do some of that work with the HIE steering committee over the coming months. Um, but so this will allow us to not be or protect us from being claims of information blocking or push to get to make the data more broadly available, but would allow us to continue our work with UVMVA and DOD to make that data available. So it's a simple addition of some language within Appendix A, um, and it's in Section 7B, where we want to say we're vital in coordination with and subject to the approval of the HIE Steering Committee. Um, so we have some firm language to say the HIE Steering Committee has or hasn't approved something for us to not to not be put in an awkward position of information blocking, but also allow for some really thoughtful um, conversations and guidance around the data governance around the types of data that we may have concerns about or how it might be used differently in other states. Um, so the proposal is really just the insertion of that and subject to the approval of, which is in red on the slide. That is my request. I'm happy to answer any questions on that one. Great. Um, I don't have any questions. We haven't noticed a vote, um, but I'll open it up to the other board members for any questions or comments they have on this. I have a couple questions. Um, one really isn't so much for you, Beth, but I think by statute, DIVA has to propose changes to the HI. E plan. So I think at minimum, we need to get something from DIVA in order for it to be compliant with the statute, but I'll leave that to our legal team to consider. Um, so that's that's just a technical okay. thing I wanted to kind of put out there. Um, the other is, if I remember correctly, that there are now or there were going to be implemented information blocking penalties, and could you just, you mentioned the concern about not you know, information blocking, but could you remind us a little bit more detail about why that is important? Yes. So as part of the 21st Century CARES Act and, and really this kind of um, push from HHS and ONC to encourage the accessibility of patient data for patient access to the data, they put in place what are referred to as information blocking rules, but they're really rules against information blocking um, and making sure that patient data is made accessible. And we and um, patients or or providers can make claims against organizations that have health data that do not share patient data. Now, it's supposed to be patient directed access to the data. There's some intricacies or, you know, kind of nuances to what the rules are. Um, but when we participate in a national exchange like eHealth Exchange, the expectation is, is we would open up for kind of more broad sharing of the data. And we want this protection to protect that. As far as I've heard, and I'm, this may not be completely accurate still, there have certainly been claims of information blocking made to ONC. Um, not against us, I'm sorry to be clear, but against some other healthcare organizations. But I haven't heard of actual penalties imposed as of yet. And there was a lot of um, uh, it, lack of specificity in some of what those penalties might look like in the actual rules and haven't really seen a lot of um, um, penalties come. Certainly claims, certainly claims substantiated, but I don't know that uh, specific penalties have been implemented yet. Thank you. That's just good to have a little more context around the request. No, thank you. I guess I have one other follow-up question, which is, um, are you thinking that you might explore an alternative to continuing the connections with UVM and the VA and DOD other than the eHealth exchange? Um, the VA and DOD, this is really the way that they want to operate. Um, so I don't think there's another option for making that data available. And we do get, you've seen the numbers, we do, they do use the data. And so we don't want yeah. to shut that down. We, ha we have a lot, you know, we do have a presence in, in Vermont and we obviously people go to other states and want access to that data. Um, UVM, there might be other ways, but this is built in and kind of, an, I'm going to say easy and the IT people would laugh at me, but this is a very consistent way that this can get into their EHR and they get this data not just from us but others in this same kind of location so would want it for that consistency and I, and I think there are other um, other healthcare organizations who might also have that same functionality that they would want it I, you know we would you know other hospitals in Vermont may also want this access and we would want to be able to enable it there 
Thank you. Okay, any other board member questions or comments? Okay, uh, healthcare advocate, do you have anything on this? Just that we fully support the amendment. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll open up to public comment on any of the vital information that was presented today. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ham Davis, how are you? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm curious. This is I, I, I don't can't I don't know whether it can be a question or a comment, but I'm curious whether um, since I think it's clear that the main issue in uh, comp in communication between various medical units is essentially vertical. It's in other words, the, a, a primary care hospital in Newport is if they get a, have a problem, they're, they're not they're not they're not going to call they're not going to call Springfield. What they're going to do is they're going to call Dartmouth. They're going to go up and down the severity uh, plane. And so what I'm curious about is uh, does the does does the Epic system, which is the most expensive and elaborate and powerful system IT system in the state, and I think is used both by UVM, which is half all of the care, and then by Dartmouth, which is a huge piece of the tertiary care on the Connecticut River and all the way into the all the way into central Vermont. Does the does the um, does does within the epic arena, within the uh, boundaries of epic um, does the problem that you've had uh, get does that does this uh, difficulty exist, this difficulty of constantly matching information bits of information flow. Um, so the vital team, if you would like to answer the question, you can. Um, otherwise, we can treat it as public comment. Up to you. If you have an answer, that's fine. If, if not, that's OK. I can give a general answer just because I want to respond and I want to make sure I understand. So you're, can I paraphrase just to ask if I'm understanding it correctly? Yeah, yeah please, yeah, please First, go ahead. Is it the question really because they use the same system, should they be able to uh, share data directly? Like, should there be? It's yes, it, that, that's that. That is precisely it. That is my understanding, anyway, which could be wrong. Okay, that the entire purpose of that the whole purpose of Epic in the first place is to um, is to uh, enable uh, an unimpeded flow of medical information up and down the system. Somebody goes to a primary care doctor and they go to a hospital and they go to a, they may go to a, then they maybe go to a tertiary center, then they may have to go somewhere else. So the question, my question is whether, um, whether um, that, that to the extent to which you, the general pro, uh, problem that you're de dealing with, I'm curious to the extent to which it is, it is obviated, whether it's solved, whether it's not solved, uh, with within the, within the within the epic system itself. So I don't want to comment fully on epic because we are not an epic customer. Right. Um, but I think where we where we do see that that the challenge will c continue is we do have a lot of practices and providers in the state that are not on the epic system. And we also have the commercial labs and we have the Department of Health who are all on different systems. So even if um, you know, we do, you're right, we do have two main provider organizations in our state that do use EPIC. But I think we're always surprised and when we have conversations with some of those organizations surprised about the amount of care patients receive outside of those systems in Vermont. And so that, that will remain to be a challenge for us, opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you, um, Thank you Mr. Chairman. So, I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're I, fine. Um, let me just say one thing. We have a bit of a timing issue that I didn't appreciate, and we've gone a little bit over. And so, Walter and Ham and Sharon, if you don't mind, I think we should actually hold public comment until we're done with everything because one of our staff members has a hard stop. Um, so, I'm going to move on. I'm going to take a two, three minute break here and we'll come back in three minutes and we'll go to the um, uh, VAS request that we received. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, but I just need to make sure our staff member is uh, okay on time. Thank you. So we'll be back at 2.33. Thank you. I think we're just waiting on uh, Tom Walsh, so we'll give him a minute. Oh, right on time. Perfect timing. 
OK, uh, we'll resume uh, with our meeting and I'll turn it over to our director of health systems finances, uh, Sarah Lindbergh, and our staff attorney, Russ McCracken, to discuss the VAS request for reconsideration of the fiscal year 24 hospital budget guidance. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thank you, Russ, for being here. Uh, so. We received a letter May 3rd, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, specifically Chair Foster, um, asking that the fiscal year 24 uh, hospital budget guidance uh, be reconsidered. Uh, there are essentially two asks uh, in the letter. Uh, it's an or as far as I can uh, interpret it, and that is either uh, the benchmark in the 24 guidance uh, is increased due to the um, financial status of our hospitals, or uh, that any enforcement for fiscal year 24 would be waived, um, such as it was for COVID. And so just to briefly uh, review the letter with you all today, um, highlighting how critical this ask is um, from Mr. Del Treco um, and asking for that amendment in our benchmark, which as you recall is net patient uh, revenue growth from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 24 budgets of 8.6% in net patient revenue. Um, as we highlighted, that would uh, not leave uh, really any wiggle room over approved fiscal year 23 budgets. And Voss uh, reshared an analysis that uh, they had shared uh, as a public comment during the guidance review about um, if you look at um, increases over time, how detrimental this would be to hospitals' bottom lines. Um, so they acknowledge that this guidance does not have the force of law. And um, I, I think uh, if it hasn't been made clear already, that it's clear to me that, you know, the uh, fiduciary responsibility to your organization would certainly trump um, any guidance that we issue um, and that the ask would be to help us understand why that um, fiduciary responsibility does not uh, fit in with the current target. Um, they also talk about risks that they feel to creating great instability to the system, um, including potentially uh, risking having to cut services or um, jeopardizing their financial position through violation of debt covenants or downgrading uh, bond ratings, um, <clears throat> as well as potentially risking uh, workforce issues. Um, and so that is highlighted in there. Um, and then uh, they think that, uh, or the argument in here is that um, the amendment would be more in line with our statutory responsibilities um, so that we can uh, support positive operating margins. Um, and so that is uh, the long and short of it. Um, I will just say, uh, you know, I think there's been a long ask about trying to develop these targets over multiple years and clearly trying to set something with so many unknowns uh, is a challenge. And so I think that one uh, important lesson that the board should be thinking about is if we are talking about multi-year targets, there probably should be a process in place for either updating or potentially revisiting some of those um, as more information becomes available potentially. Um, but I think that this is kind of um, tough tension uh, to try to set something for multiple years and then have it, um, you know, asked to be changed midway through when we acknowledge this is something that was set in the past. Uh, in all fairness, there was concerns that it was not adequate when it was set at that time. So um, there had been some concerns raised back with the uh, fiscal year 23 guidance. Um, so uh, I think that the way it'll make the most sense to handle this procedurally is happy to talk about this with the board today. Uh, but staff are recommending uh, a public comment period for the next week, and we can take up the vote at uh, next Wednesday's meeting, and that would give the board a chance to gather more information um, from Vermonters and other folks impacted by this guidance. So that's pretty much all I have to say on this topic. I can uh, stop sharing the letter here and uh, address any questions or comments that the board may have. Sure, thank you. Um... Do any board members have questions or comments? Um, I, I have just a 
couple, Director Lindbergh, if that's okay. Um, first, I would just say that I support public comment on this. I think it'll be beneficial. So if the recommendation is to open it for a week, um, I think that's logical and we should receive that. So um, I support doing that. Um, and then just a couple quick things. Vital um, earlier spoke about um, their cost increases that they've experienced over the last several years, which I presume is not you know, something that they're experiencing alone. Um, if the board were to increase the guidance by the $82 million identified in the letter, where would those funds come from, if you have a sense? Sure. Um, so net patient revenue increases are agnostic to where the funds uh, specifically come for, but historically, um, the area where we kind of try to fill the gap tends to be in the commercial rate ask. So it's the um, prices that commercial rate payers pay at hospitals um, if there is a delta between what um, the government is uh, able to pay and what is needed to fund operations. Okay, so it could be from Medicaid, Medicare. Historically, it's generally commercial. Correct. And the only other question I had, um, I think my understanding is correct, but in previous years, hospitals have come in above guidance. Is that right? Yes. And Previously, the board has approved um, requests above guidance. Is that correct? Yes. And if a hospital this year feels it appropriate and necessary to submit a request above guidance, um, could you explain the process to us of how we would review that? Sure. Um, we'll be using a process similar to the one we used last year, where uh, for those that are above guidance, we understand, we look into the um, evidence that the filing has to support that in uh, that request that's above the guidance. And so uh, this year we further focus that to try to organize uh, that in looking at expense growth specifically and where expenses uh, are. And assuming, you know, that's all um, uh, built on reasonable assumptions, which uh, by and large is what we saw last year. Uh, we look to see if there's any uh, developing information about uh, changes to governmental rates potentially uh, that might impact uh, that request. And uh, that that's how we handled that last year. So it's, uh, you know, just trying to understand the evidence supporting uh, the, re the request. One of the things highlighted in this letter as a concern um, is the short turnaround between um, when the board makes a decision and when they have to begin operating under that budget. Is there anything that we can do about that or to address that concern? Because I do, do think it seems like a valid concern. Yes, um, so that is, I think, uh, a bigger question <laughs> that the board has wrestled with for a long time. But um, how, uh, what ways, if if any, can we kind of adjust our regulatory calendar uh, to reduce some of that tension? And you know, there's, uh, I think, you know, again, if we're going to some sort of multi-year process, um, that might offer us more opportunity um, to expedite that. Um, but we are also working around the rate review calendar, uh, which is challenging for the board. <laughs> that's set by statute? So uh, the, the QHP rate review process is federal law. Um, hospitals uh, fiscal years are st set by state statute. Uh, and at the deadlines for our hospital budget process uh, are, uh, we must have the decisions by September 15th is in statute, but many of the other deadlines are either in rule or guidance. Um, I don't have any other questions. Thank you for that. And Russ, correct me if I got any of that wrong, please. <laughs> I think I got it right. Any other board members? Could I just uh, okay. piggyback one quick question on what you asked? If uh, Sarah, do you have any idea, um, roughly speaking, if there was an $86 million increase to commercial insurance, what that would be roughly in a commercial insurance rate increase for that group of people? So it depends. Um, we have to uh, remember that, you know, the um, hospital prices increases for Vermont hospitals is just a portion of the premium uh, that any commercial plan would feel. And there's going to be a great deal of variability depending on the plan and the cost sharing of that plan in terms of the uh, net impact to a consumer. 
So um, it, it's a, a difficult thing to uh, spitball on and uh, varies greatly depending on the consumer situation. I'm happy to try to model some of that at a high level, um, but it's going to be imperfect <laughs> uh, to a high degree. Do you, do you know, since we know last year's commercial rate increase, uh, do you know what the the total amount of NPR generated, the, the total increase in NPR generated from commercial insurance would have been in last year's rate to sort of estimate what that would mean to this year's rate? Um, yeah, I think that um, I lost track of what kind of rate we're talking about. I'm sorry. Are we talking about uh, premium? Commercial. <laughs> Uh, well, we talk about commercial sh insurance rate increases. To, yeah, premium. I guess what I would say premium rate increases. Okay. Uh, so what I, I can fairly easily do is look at how much um, revenue has changed and at a high level utilization has changed uh, by payer type. But again, that's, uh, you know, marginal um, and a little tricky, but I can certainly pull that together uh, to review for next week. That'd be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, healthcare advocate, do you have any questions or comments? Good afternoon. Um, Sam Price, also the healthcare advocate. I'll make a few brief comments and then I'll turn it over to Mike for sure. Uh, we recommend that the board actually stand by the approved guidance. It's already been approved by the board after a pretty extended and open process that both Oz and the HCA participated in. And just to echo a couple of points that you said, Chair Foster, nothing prevents hospitals from proposing a budget that exceeds the guidance. I think page six lays this out pretty clearly. If a hospital's budget exceeds the NPR FVP growth, the board will review the specifics and support for the growth provided the hospital and its criteria using the factors and criteria in the guidance. Um, and as you pointed out, it's not uncommon that historically hospitals submit budgets that exceed that guidance. And these have always been considered, and oftentimes they've been submitted as approved or approved as submitted rather, and or approved with minor modifications. And I think, given that we're a month and a half out from when we expect to receive budgets, I think there's a logistical concern too to prolonging this process that I think we've all uh, participated in in an open and um, collaborative way. So I'll leave it at that and turn it to Mike. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, board. And I just want to do a double check that you can hear me. Um, so uh, two very uh, simple points I want to make. Uh, one of them is that, um, well, you know, Vermonters clearly need sustainable hospitals. Um, Vermonters also need sustainable independent providers. And we have a fear that an in, uh, uh, unintended consequence of the board regulating hospitals and not hospital budgets and not regulating independent um, provider budgets is that um, is that hospitals end up getting an assured revenue stream uh, uh, through the hospital budget process and you know, to the detriment of independent providers. So I wanted to make that point. Um, I also wanted to make the traditional comment you you would expect from me uh, about affordability. Um, and I think the you know the discussion earlier about um, small group is uh, small group rates is appropriate uh, you know given uh, for this year for next year and the year after the enhanced premium tax credits individuals are significantly protected um, from uh, from rate increases but small businesses aren't. Um, Small businesses, including uh, municipalities, including nonprofit sector, and uh, and you know, I would report very similarly about Vermont Legal Aid's uh, the pressures on Vermont Legal Aid also in the exchange. Um, so, um, I, you know, I I, I want to with as much passion as I can give uh, um, recognize the challenges that Vermonters are facing today. Um, if you haven't noticed, everything is more expensive. Everything, and uh, and Vermonters are are feeling that, and um, and calling our office with you know real concerns when they have healthcare expenses, um, and 
uh, I just want to make sure that that concern, uh, I know that concern is on your minds, but I thought it important to say it out loud here um, that as you uh, consider changes to the uh, hospital budget guidance that the other side of the equation is um, who's going to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think you sort of summarized our challenges pretty well. Uh, we need sustainable hospitals, independence, and affordability. It's really obviously something we grapple with every day. Um, I'm going to open up to public comment um, on this so that folks don't have to wait till after the um, ACO presentation. Um, I see a couple hands up. Um, uh, Ms. Gutwin, how are you? Please go ahead. Thanks. I'll be brief this time um, because Mike actually has already said uh, what's most important to my heart. So thanks, Mike. Um, I just also wanted to say I appreciate the conversation after the uh, presentation, especially what uh, Tom said that the best value of uh, a common health information database is what will be helpful to providers in managing chronic disease. Six out of 10 adults have some form of chronic disease. And uh, so while immunizations are important, it's, it's minute compared to the big apple. And uh, so any efforts really, if we're gonna get a bang for the buck, it's gotta be the sharing of what goes into chronic care management and, and Tom articulated that very well. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, Mr. Davis, I think you're next. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I think we're just now talking about uh, Mike Del Treco's um, in his issue here, or, or are we going back to the previous situation? Um, let's keep it exciting. Let's do either. <laughs> okay. okay. In so far as Insofar as uh, insofar as the uh, guidance is concerned, number one, I just think it makes no sense to do two-year guidance. I never I don't, don't think it ever made any sense, and it becomes irrelevant by the second year. It just doesn't work at all. Um, secondly, I think that um, the the uh, given the way that healthcare is the whole issue of supplier-induced demand and that kind of thing, that the that the uh, issue ought to be not a net patient revenue per se, but uh, or uh, but should should the, the what it really what it really should be should be cost per capita in the service area, and, and which uh, would con, com, uh, conform to some of the kind of data you get in the Dartmouth the Dartmouth um, the Dartmouth Health Atlas. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughts, um, Mr. Del Treco, um, and. Um, Mr. Otrecco, just I'll identify you as the author of the request, just so folks know, um, but thank please you. go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to thank the board for taking this issue up today. I know how important this work is, and additionally, I want the board to know that not only, not only myself, but the entire board um, takes this request uh, very seriously. And ahead of sending this letter, we worked um, for over a month to try to evaluate how to manage the guidance in its current form. Um, the guidance creates basically two options, one to be in compliance or two to be out of compliance. So if we remain in compliance with the guidance, I think we will certainly exacerbate the current issues related to our ability to meet patient demand, along with our ability to invest in our communities and our staff. This is not a simple issue. This will further erode access, challenge our ability to meet debt obligations, increase that the chance that bond ratings and downgrades are may happen, and likely jeopardize the solvency of some of our organizations. If we're out of compliance, we enter into a space, as you mentioned, of great uncertainty. We'll need to wait for the hearing process to unfold and for our budget orders to be finalized to understand the resources we have to run our operations. Um, both of these situations are not pretty, and they are sure to deteriorate public perception on the work we do. We need guidance that reflects the economic realities of what we are faced with today. 
In 2023, guidance did just that. The growth rate was set at an approved 8.6%, and those budgets were approved at 8.5. The economic pressures that we recognized in 2023 remain. Inflation is still very high, the workforce challenges remain, and the predictability of supply chain changes daily. So in this moment, it's difficult to understand how the board in in your deliberation of setting the guidance allowed for a 0.1% growth rate from 23. Um, so I appreciate the time to digest and think about public comment. So um, we'll 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 work on that and 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 be back in touch with you. I do want to speak to a comment that's been made um, around what has historically happened if a if a hospital has gone over guidance. And just let me frame this out for a moment. A lot of work historically has gone up on on the front end of development of guidance, um, where that guidance around net patient service revenue growth was more tied to some of the economic pressures. And when hospitals submitted their budgets in July of the year in, that we, were, we would be dealing with, the magnitude of change from the guidance has been relatively small. In this instance, we would see um, quite the contrary. We would see hospitals submitting budgets far exceeding um, the guidance as it's been outlined. That in itself creates an incredible problem. It's it is it's not apples to apples what has happened historically to what is happening today. And again, I think having a 0.1% uh, growth rate from current 23 um, is is a very difficult concept to understand and how that rate was set. So uh, thank you for the time and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you for those points and for your request. Um, uh, Mr. Tester, um, and could you identify uh, where you're from if you're associated with a regulated entity and, and please go ahead. Sure, absolutely. And uh, thank you for uh, taking my comments. I'm Sean Tester. I'm the CEO of Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital and a, uh, member of Vaz, <clears throat> um, I really also appreciate you guys taking this up. I think many of the longtime board members here will will recognize that NVRH. We've always tried very hard to to take into consideration the guidance that's given us and, and tried to provide a budget that was reasonable. Although sometimes over that guidance, it was always reasonable and justifiable. I think. The challenge we're facing is this is the first time where as we put together our budget and you look at uh, the pressures we're facing that we're going to be significantly over that guidance and um, without jeopardizing the care in our community. I think Mike Fisher really summed it up well when he said everything is more expensive right now and, and that couldn't be more true for healthcare uh, inflation. The market rate uh, inflation we're seeing on our critical workforce is just beyond anything that we ever imagined could happen over the course of a couple of years, and we don't see that abating. Um, I know all of you have seen the, the uh, results year to date for the uh, Vermont's hospitals. It doesn't look pretty, and I can share with you that we just closed the books on April. In April, we had a $460,000 loss alone. Um, this this uh, this is not getting better, folks. It's um, we have currently here at the hospital. I have over 60 uh, job openings that we're unable to fill, and I have 22 travelers on staff. Um, and while traveler rates have come down somewhat, um, that is still uh, creating a gaping wound uh, hole in our in our financials. Um, and it's coming down to difficult choices. Do we staff up with travelers or do I limit beds that we, on our med surge floor? Because those are the difficult decisions that we're being forced into. This will have a direct impact on our ability to meet the community's uh, health care needs. So um, I just encourage all of you to be thoughtful as you go through this process. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for those thoughts, uh, Mr. Tester. Um, and Walter, I apologize. I skipped over you. I think you were next, so I apologize. But but please go ahead. Well, no worries, Owen. Sorry, and how I'm dressed. I'm here at the the state park where I work, and it's about 35 below zero right now. It was snowing earlier here. Um, I was really just 
asking about vital, but I want to just to back up what Mike Fisher said and to say that, and also as well, and also Owen, when he was asking about <clears throat> who pays for this, is who pays for this? It's us. It comes out of our pockets, all the hospital budgets, everything, as we all know. And our wages don't rise to meet these increased costs. So. I guess I'll just end it there. I mean, Mike said Vermonters are struggling. Yes, we are. My cost just went up by 300 bucks a month now. And it's just, at some point, you can't go any higher or we're all gonna be broke. So in a way, I agree with the budget guidance through that amendment. And Walter, did you have anything on vital you wanted to share as well? Or? Oh, I just wanted to ask the vital people about um, can about patients being able to look at their records or whatever. Um, I had a situation way back in the 1980s before the digital age or when it was just being born where my father was seriously ill and he had an a medical evaluation that basically said that, you know, he's not coming back and we're not going to bother to help him. And we couldn't find out who gave that evaluation. And I was just wondering if the same situation had happened in the digital vital age. Could I, as a patient or a family member of a patient, been able to go back through the records? <clears throat> So I can answer that um, question for you. Um, we welcome Vermonters to request their records through the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Um, we um, regularly deliver Vermonters who have made this request their, their record, everything that all of the information that is available about their care that's available in the Vermont Health Information Exchange, we can send that um, to you. Certainly, there's we're, we're very careful about who we make that available to, and there needs to be sort of a, like a notarized form um, saying that um, you are the person requesting your information. Now, if um, you are an authorized representative of um, an, another person um, and legally have the right to their record, um, that is also possible. Um, so record requests are possible. How would the average... How would the average Joe or Mary Vermonter figure that out? So there's information about that on our website. Um, and we certainly welcome folks to, to call and um, talk to our support team and they can help help you with that request or, or help any Vermonter with that request. Does that answer the question? Getting there, but I'll let others go. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Um, and Mr. Peter Wright, if you could identify yourself and, and please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Foster. My name is Peter Wright. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Northwestern Medical Center here in St. Albans, Vermont. Uh, I just want to echo some of the comments and put some real life connection to some of the consequences. As we put together our budget and look at this guidance as it stands today, we would be forced to make a decision about um, following the guidance to the letter, uh, meeting our fiduciary responsibilities and ensuring that we can meet our, excuse me, debt covenants and other uh, uh, obligations, as well as the most important part, which is being able to serve the community. So, so being hamstrung into kind of saying there's gonna be a, a rate cap or um, an expense cap, we would have to do somewhat draconian measures like cap inpatient census and say, OK, I'm no longer going to hire more traveling nurses, as Mr. Uh, Mr. Tester said. Um, and thus, instead of a census of 38 being my capable capacity, um, I may have to bring it down to 32 or 28. Um, uh, you know, not enabling us to serve the community the way we're, we've been put here to do, and then putting more downward pressure um, on inpatient capacity in other hospitals, particularly the medical center, which is, as you know, tight on a, on a very good day. I did also want to make one more comment, and I was stringing some um, 
connections together. There seemed to be a, a conversation earlier about, you know, if hospital uh, rate increases were improved, what would that mean for insurance uh, premium rate increases for commercial payers? And I think there's a long history in the state of Vermont of a disconnection between uh, hospital rates and insurance premiums. There's plenty of examples where rates have not gone up in a particular market yet um, for a hospital yet gone up for uh, businesses and, and insurance um, uh, carriers. So I, I think it's important just to kind of say there is not a, a direct link between if you raise X percent in a hospital budget that will increase a premium of a commercial insurance carrier in that market. Thank you for the time. Great, and, and thank you for um, attending and participating today. Uh, any other public comment on this? Okay, great. Um, Director Lindbergh and Mr. McCracken, thank you very much and, and have a good day. I think Russ, we might see you again in a minute, um, but Sarah, have a good day. Um, we'll turn next to the uh, One Care Vermont Revised Budget. We have a staff presentation. Um, Russ, was before there we something do that, you Chair Foster, if you oh. don't mind, I just want to confirm we're going to open a special public comment period on this request, have it open for a week, come back at the next board meeting next Wednesday uh, for an opportunity to, for the board to vote on the request at that point. That's fine with me. If you think that's sufficient time for all their scheduling needs based on all the deadlines we have on that, that's perfectly reasonable. Yep, we'll do that. Okay, okay, thanks for clarifying, Russ. All right, thanks all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so uh, we will be hearing uh, about One Care from uh, Michelle Sawyer, our Health Policy Project Director, uh, and Marissa Melamed, our Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, and Mr. McCracken, of course. So, uh, Ms. Sawyer, I'll turn it to you. Thank you very much, Chair Foster. Um, good afternoon. Uh, as Chair Foster said, I am Michelle Sawyer, Health Policy Project Director with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I am joined today by Marissa Melamed, Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, and Russ McCracken, Staff Attorney. We are here today to further discuss One Care Vermont's fiscal year 23 certification status, the benchmarking report, and their revised budget. So the agenda uh, for this afternoon, <laughs> We will start with an update on One Care certifi uh, certification eligibility verification. Uh, then Marissa will provide an update on the benchmarking report, and I will present some slides regarding the revised budget analysis, starting with a couple of background slides, a review of One Care's changes in their risk model and population health programs, uh, and then we'll wrap up with Russ walking us through a staff recommendation for the board to consider. And I did just want to make a note um, about the scope of the revised budget review in particular. Um, the staff and the board are here today to consider changes that have been made since the last time that the board approved One Care's budget um, with conditions. So the items that were unchanged between the initial and the revised budget are not topics for conversation or discussion today um, as they were previously analyzed and ultimately approved by the board back in December. Uh, this slide also shows a timeline, um, and I'll just highlight those last couple of dates that there is a potential vote scheduled for next Wednesday, and then if we need it, there is an additional potential vote scheduled. So we'll start with um, the certification update. So the Green Mountain Care Board staff have completed their review of One Care's fiscal year 23 certification eligibility verification, uh, and we will be sending a memo to the board later this week uh, covering a review of each section of the rule. Uh, the memo will be posted publicly on the Green Mountain Care Board website when it is completed. Uh, and the staff have concluded that the eligibility requirements for fiscal year 23 are being met. Um, however, given the level of interest among board members around executive compensation under Rule 5, Section 5.203A, the staff have requested additional information from One Care, um, which may inform the staff's recommendation for fiscal year 24 certification and budget guidance. Um, and those guidances will be presented to the board in June and uh, voted on before July 1st. 
I will now hand it over to Marissa uh, to discuss the benchmarking reports. Thank you, Michelle. And good afternoon to the board, members of the public. Uh, I'm going to review where we're at on the status of the benchmarking report requirement. So uh, on May 3rd, we discussed the One Care Vermont Medicare Performance Benchmarking Report submission against the budget order requirements. That's condition one. On May 5th, One Care presented their revised budget, including a presentation of their benchmarking report and results. And in addition, the Green Mountain Care Board staff met with One Care and their benchmarking vendor uh, with the HCA as well last week to review report usability considerations and methodological concerns. Today, I will present the staff recommendation and next step for this requirement. You can go to the next slide. So as a reminder, the ultimate objective for the Green Mountain Care Board is to have a valid report to use to track relevant performance metrics over time and to understand how One Care Vermont uses those metrics to set clinical priorities and make budgeting decisions. At our last staff presentation, I shared the following questions as discussion guides for reviewing this requirement. Um, so I just want to make, to, to Michelle's point at the beginning, I just want to make clear that there is a budget condition number one. This is more of a review of the status. Um, the staff uh, isn't recommending any changes to that condition. Um, so we're bringing this up today as sort of uh, this is where we're at um, because this has been you know, a bit of a process to, to work through. So I'm bringing these questions back up because um, they were presented or shown on, on May 3rd. And I wanna just talk through where we're at with them a little bit. So the first question is, uh, the development of this report has been an iterative process between Green Mountain Care Board, One Care, and their vendor. Is the Green Mountain Care Board ready to accept this report for use as a consistent performance measurement tool? Does One Care intend to use this report in creating their budget and in their quality evaluation and improvement program? Uh, so as we've sort of worked through this process and the discussion, what we've been hearing as a staff is that we are ready to move forward with this report. Um, and, and use it the way it was intended with some changes um, that I'm going to review that have been discussed. Um, and that, you know, One Care has talked about how they intend to use the report um, for, their, for their budget and quality evaluation improvement program. And that's something that we will look for uh, as we move forward uh, with guidance and, and the 24 budget submission. Uh, question two, again, we can, open up discussion on this as the board discusses this. So I'm just gonna go through kind of what we've, what we've heard on this so far. Um, number two is the Green Mountain Care Board required establishing ACO performance benchmarks to help answer the following questions. Uh, how well can an ACO perform in each metric? How does One Care Vermont perform in each metric in comparison to an ACO that gets the best results in each metric? So last, in the past couple of meetings, we talked through the two different cohorts. Um, sort of their strengths and weaknesses. And um, we believe that, uh, you know, with some limitations as any report has, um, the report can be used to understand sort of best practices, um, or sorry, sorry, not best practices, best performance um, and uh, comparison to like ACOs. Best practice is a little different. We can talk about that. Um, next slide. Question three, um, we asked and discussed with the vendor specifically, does the March 31st report allow GMCB to track one care performance over time? Um, so is it is it valid to show those measures um, and look at them year over year? And they confirmed that it is. Um, we have a sort of proposal that we're looking at to, to show that more clearly. Uh, question four, uh, question four and five are a little bit, uh, are a little bit ongoing, um, but we have had good discussions about them. What are the strengths and weaknesses of this report to show us the relationship between One Care's efforts and performance improvement? Um, as I think this board and um, anyone else who's been following this work is very aware, it's uh, extremely difficult to make a causal link between um, specific programs uh, and performance. So there's gonna be a number of things that um, we would need to look at to, to sort of understand the relationship between one care efforts and performance improvement. Um, so I think, and, you know, we believe that this report can be used as, as one, you know, piece of information to look at, um, and we hope to better kind of outline the, the strengths and weaknesses there. 
um, as we as we go forward using the report. And then number five is this report allow one care to calculate the return on investment of population health investments, payment initiatives, and administrative expenses. I believe the answer to that is that it um, it does not directly, but we have heard from one care and discussed um, in in previous presentations, how that this might be done going forward. Um, so again, making it part of uh, sort of the different evaluative tools that the board uh, can use to look at uh, one care performance. Uh, so with that slide nine, um, here is a summary of the things that we've discussed over the past couple of weeks uh, to make some improvements to the to the next iteration of the report. Um, and that is that each report uh, submission would be accompanied by the following things. A description of the comparison cohorts and the exclusion criteria. So making sure that that kind of follows each report so that it's clear to anyone reading and interpreting the report. A description of the benchmarking methodology. Uh, that is how the metrics and the benchmarks are calculated. The data sources and data dictionary. Any limitations, caveats, or interpretation notes an executive summary of the results, and then um, a year-over-year -year trend report, excuse me, for selected metrics. So the following slide 10 uh, is, is next steps for this requirement. Uh, and that will be uh, make sure that this is communicated clearly with One Care. Um, we've, you know, we've had conversations with them um, and uh, we'll, we we want to make sure that the expectations are are clear, uh, and this is one step in that process, uh, including any additional, you know, comments, questions, or concerns that board members want to discuss here. Um, we intend to develop the year-over-year -year trend report for selected metrics to include in the FY24 guidance development. So I showed a template of that report at the May 3rd presentation. Um, one care also had a version, sort of a bar chart version of year over year metrics. Um, and we would like to have a um, sort of come together on what that is going to look like uh, for the next the next report, um, which also the um, requirements for that would be would be included in the guidance, which we are working on basically as we speak this season. Uh, and then third, the uh, FY24 certified ACO guidance is expected to include requirements to tie performance benchmarks to the budget. Um, so that is an understanding of uh, that objective that I stated in the beginning, um, you know, understanding how one care is making budgeting decisions um, based on uh, performance outcomes. And that is all I have on an update on the benchmarking report. I'll pass it back to Michelle for the revised budget analysis. Thank you, Marissa. All right, um, so the budget guidance issued to One Care, as well as the budget order, require a, bu a revised budget to be presented in the spring of the budget year. One Care presented their budget last Friday, May 5th, which included elements described in the fiscal year 23 budget order, as well as other changes made between the initial and revised budgets. I want to highlight that the board may adjust uh, the, an ACO's budget if they find its performance has varied substantially from its approved budget, which in the case of One Care is the budget approved last December. And this slide is really here for reference. This is the section of Rule 5 that gives the Green Mountain Care Board the authority to adjust an ACO's budget. This list highlights areas where One Care's performance has varied substantially from the last approved budget. All of the items on this list were presented by One Care during their hearing. Um, you may notice this list does not include any of the Green Mountain Care Board ordered changes, such as the 2% administrative expense cut or the increase in One Care held risk for the Medicare Advanced Shared Savings Dollars. 
Um, the list also omits the $2 million from DIVA being paid directly to providers from for PHM bonus earnings. Uh, as this change was not material to how the programs operate or the, finance, the financials of the PHM program, given that uh, OneCare had tentatively accounted for those DIVA um, dollars in their uh, initial budget. So there has been uh, a significant reduction in the amount of risk held by the entire network um, and the providers. Uh, in the revised budget, the amount of upside potential earnings is reduced by about 9.8 million at the network level, and it's reduced by 9.9 .9 million at the provider level. The downside risk is reduced by 1.4 million for the network and 5 million for the providers. Um, in addition to the board ordered Medicare advanced shared savings dollars that OneCare now carries its risk, these changes came about because of the loss of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont payer program, the addition of the new UVM Health Network self-funded payer program, and um, due to changes in the risk corridors for both the Medicaid and the MVP um, programs between the initial and revised budgets. We heard from OneCare during their hearing on the 5th about changes made to their population health programs. The PHM program itself had a reduction in funding due mainly to the loss of the Blue Cross attributed lives. Uh, while the DIVA funding model changed between the budgets, as I mentioned, DIVA's amount of $2 million into the PHM program through direct provider payments did not change. Um, on this slide, under the total row, you can see a reduction of about 3.7 million, but the DIVA payments to providers for PHM bonus earnings reduces that shortfall uh, by 2 million. So the difference between the two budgets is essentially 1.6 million uh, for population health efforts. Um, one notable program change is the addition of the mental health screening and follow-up initiative. Uh, and there was also a change to the CPR program that arranged for uh, MVP lives to be included in the count of attributed lives for those providers participating in the CPR program. I'm going to hand it over to Russ now to walk us through the staff recommendation. Um, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so this is a different situation than um, the board has been in historically in past years. The final budget that one care submitted in March um, really wasn't material, didn't have anything materially different than the budget that the board had approved back in the fall. Um, so we haven't encountered this particular situation where um, the current approved one care budget is the budget one care submitted to the board um, back in the fall and the board approved uh, it. It has some substantial differences, which Michelle walked through, um, that were clear from the material submitted by OneCare and OneCare's presentation to the board. Um, the fact that there is this difference has been communicated to OneCare, uh, but it hasn't been uh, communicated by the full board in the form of a finding. <clears throat> um, we have some concerns and we see an issue with OneCare uh, operating under a budget that has um, some pretty significant differences from what the board had approved. Um, so it's really up to one care to request an amendment. Uh, the board can't make the change or update the board's approval without um, application from one care. Um, and that's set out in rule uh, 5.407, which Michelle uh, showed earlier. So what we're proposing here as a next step is again following the uh, performance review um, provisions of Rule 5.407. Uh, the board make a determination that the ACO's performance has varied substantially from its budget, and the board um, provide written notice of that to the ACO, which will be in the form of a, a letter. Um, That's our recommendation. I'm happy to take questions. I think this is a deficiency that is pretty easy, could be pretty easy to cure um, from one care with a, a request that the board update its budget approval to reflect what is the final um, uh, the final budget that it's operating under. 
Um, but at, at this stage, given where we are, we recommend the board make this determination and send it in writing to one care. Great, thank you both. Um, I'll open it up to the board members for any uh, questions or comments. Um, I, I have a couple. Um, uh, first, I, I wanted to observe that I think that this benchmarking in the report that we got, it, it's really great and gives us in the sense that it gives us an opportunity and one care an opportunity to identify um, where they can make a difference and how they can focus some of their programmatic efforts and their investments, which historically I don't think has been available. Um, we just heard from um, the hospitals, a couple hospital executives and VAS about the very concerning financial challenges they have. And we heard about independent practices, financial challenges, and we've heard about people's um, ability to afford and pay for care. And so we're sort of at a time where um, it, it couldn't be more timely for one care to have these uh, data points as to where they can focus their investments to try and tackle uh, through their uh, work some of our biggest challenges. Um, so we can identify them, they can be measured, and we can see if they're working. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's I'm really hopeful and optimistic um, that we see that happen and then we see some of those uh, measures where one care was uh, underperforming, um, see the gap close to the cohorts that they're compared to and where they do well, um, even improve on that if possible. And I think next year when we have the information, we'll be able to look at the budget more granularly with that information. So I'm really excited about the opportunity that's here for One Care and the benchmarking that we have. And just tying through um, need and, and uh, work efforts. Um, so I think that's a great step. Um, I had a couple quick questions. Um, it sounds like we'll be using the benchmarking primarily right now in our guidance work. Is that correct, Michelle? Yes, I will hand it to Marissa um, for for benchmarking related questions, but that that is the intention. Um, and I can I can speak to that a little bit more. I, I as Marissa described, I think what we'll really use this report for is being able to tie specific metrics that we're seeing um one care maybe there maybe there's room for improvement and then being able to identify where in their budget they are prioritizing improvement um in those areas so we're really looking forward to to be able to use this as a tool um for regulatory purposes as well great um and then i had flagged an issue last time we were here relating to the potential concern relating to the um, PHM PCP payments to hospitals and ensuring that it actually is going to primary care uh, efforts. Can you uh, update me on where we are on that? Or are we doing it in guidance? Are we doing it in hospital budgets or any sort of suggestions around that? Sure. Um... That is an area that the staff are, uh, as we're drafting guidance um, for next year, I think it, it probably will appear there, um, some ways to get at that. I do also think that there's room for ex, you know, exploring that on the hospital budget side as well. Um, but I do think I do think that in our ACO oversight tasks that that we might be able to to make some progress in that in that realm. And um, on the suggested motion language, um, I, I don't think it's necessary for a regulator to provide advance notice, although it sounds like here we did. Um, Russ, could you just describe for us any notice that was provided to OneCare relating to this compliance issue? Um, sure, Chair Foster. First, I would point to a um, letter that you sent to OneCare in uh, February, I believe. Um, specifically calling one care out of compliance with their budget order. Um, I think that letter was received with an invitation to the full board to um, 
take action under the rule as as needed. Um, but don't want to don't want to summarize all of that. I also had a, a brief call with one cares in house counsel. Um, where I expressed my opinion that I thought one care would want to be operating under uh, an approved budget and also that um, it really it, it it needs the request for a budget need a budget amendment rather needs to come from one care and, and isn't going to be imposed by the Green Mountain Care Board. Thank you. Um, I have no other questions or comments um, other than to say that I, I would support the motion uh, given that history. Thank you. I do have one question, Russ. In your conversation, it was do you have an do we know why they haven't submitted a budget amendment request? I do not. And if we so if we I don't, can't. that's fine. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> um, no, thank you for the question. I I don't know, so I uh, won't answer. Thanks. Russ, I have one quick question too. Um, and maybe this was covered, and I and I need a refresher. But what are the legal or meaningful implications of one care uh, running their organization under approved budget that is substantially different, where where, where their current uh, budget is substantially different from their approved budget? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the board approves a, a budget and, um, you know, I think the reason that we do that is with understanding that an entity is going to operate generally within the parameters of that budget. You know that there are some variations. Um, operating sort of far outside of that, I think, opens up other potential um, areas under the rule of enforcement action. For example, 547D says the board may take any and all actions within its power to compel compliance with an established budget. So I think a regulated entity wants its established budget uh, to reflect its its actual um, you know, its actual performance as one example. I don't have any further questions. Any other questions or comments from the board? I will turn it to the healthcare advocate. Thank you. Sorry, a little slow getting up yet. Um, Member Lund asked the question that I was going to ask. We support the staff recommendation. Um, and I'll just add that I think I just want to thank the board staff for all their work on this. I mean, it's a lot of different moving parts and pieces. Um, I think the benchmarking report is a good start. Um, I think one of the key questions that the board staff lagged, which that was really good, is the return on investment. I think there is opportunity for growth on that. Um, I think there's still some work that can be done to better get at the causal questions that I think we're all wondering about in terms of quality and accountability. Um, but I think it's a good start, so thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll open it up to public comment via the raise your hand function. Okay, seeing none, um, Russ, could you put the motion language back up, please? Michelle, do you mind doing that? Thank you. 
Okay, I'll move that the board hereby determine that One Care's fiscal year 23 performance has varied substantially from its 23 uh, budget as approved by the board with respect to the areas of the budget listed on slides 14 through 16, which were included in One Care's revised fiscal year 23 budget in which One Care presented to the GMCB. One Care should correct this deficiency by requesting the GMCB amend its approval of One Care's fiscal year 23 budget. This determination shall be summarized in a letter and sent to One Care from the GMCB. I'll second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. And um, uh, Russ, Marissa, and Michelle, thank you very much um, for your work on uh, this. It's been a lot, and so we really recognize that and appreciate all that you've done on this. Thank you very much. And I think that is all we have on the agenda today. Um, so I'll turn to any new business or old business. And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries and we are adjourned. Everyone have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks.